This is the WOW Signal Podcast, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. Hello, it's the 14th of January, 2016, and this is Season 3, Episode 3 of The Wow Signal. I'm your host, Paul Carr, and tonight we have a completely unscripted, hastily arranged episode that was stimulated by the release of a preprint by Bradley Schaefer today. Now, Dr. Schaefer is an astronomer of considerable experience and renown. Dr. Schaefer has published a paper in which he finds a gradual but definitive dimming of a star that's come to be known as Tabby's star. Now, Tabby's star is more formally known as KIC. 8462852. A few months ago, Tabitha Boyajian and her team reported that they had seen in the Kepler telescope data very sharp dips in the brightness of this star, much, much larger dips than anyone had seen for a planet passing in front of the star. In fact, much larger than a planet could cause, even an extremely large planet. So this was a bit of a mystery. They saw two of these dips, and one of the hypotheses they put forward to explain the dips was a big swarm of comets. Now, they they were honest about it. They said this is the, the best of a lot of bad ideas, but it's the best one we have big swarm of comets that could have been orbiting the star and dimmed the stars that passed by. A lot of comets, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Today, Bradley Schaefer put out a preprint of a paper he submitted to the Journal of Astrophysics Letters. It's called KIC 8462852 Faded at an average rate of 0.165 plus or minus 0.013 magnitudes per century from 1890 to 1989. Now, you have to understand that in astronomy, the magnitudes are on a logarithmic scale because they vary over such a wide range from the extremely bright to the very dim. So 0.165 magnitudes is actually quite a lot of dimming, especially for what is called a main sequence star. Now, we'll talk about a main sequence star and what's what's about to come. That means essentially most stars during the duration, the most of the duration of their lifetime, they're on the main sequence. Now, when a star is dying, it goes off the main sequence and becomes a red giant or a white dwarf or uh, uh, even eventually a neutron star or even a black hole. But the the vast majority of stars for most of their life are main sequence stars. They know from studying this star that it is a main sequence star, a very ordinary star, something called an F-class star, which means it's a little bigger and a little brighter and a little hotter than our sun but not dramatically, just a bit. The the star in question, Tabby star, uh, was has nothing unusual about it except for these dips in its magnitude. And so it's a bit of a mystery. And these, these dips are, are very large. So what Bradley Schaefer did is studied historical data, as we'll discuss in the interview that follows. I spoke to Dr. Schaefer on the 14th of January, 2016, 
And he explained to me what his paper is all about, how he reached the conclusions he reached, and what he thinks it implies. Now, of course, like any good scientist, he is averse to speculation. So he's just going to tell you we simply don't know what is causing these very strange dimming of Tabby's star, both over a very long term, over a century, and over a time period of about one day, which was observed in the Kepler data. When Boyajian et al. published their results, it included a number of follow-up observations. They confirmed, for example, that the star is not moving away from us at ridiculous speeds, or uh, that it's anything other than an ordinary main sequence F-class star. They also checked to see if there could possibly be a companion, and they found that it's extremely unlikely that there's a dark companion anywhere near. So those are among the explanations that were refuted by the data. Since that paper has been published, there have been infrared observations which have further ruled out what is called IR excess, which means more infrared radiation than we would expect from the star. That would mean that something near the star was absorbing sunlight and re-radiating it as heat. Well, that wasn't found in more detailed observations after the paper was published. In addition, there were SETI searches of the star. Now, these were fairly limited, but in both radio and looking at for laser flashes, nothing was seen that could be interpreted as an attempt to signal Earth. That is, by the way, not a big surprise. Even if you think there were intelligent aliens at that star, there's no reason to believe they would, 1,485 years ago, send a signal to us within the time frame that of a few weeks. There, it's just... Um, it's a long shot. So you have to remember that if there is an intelligent or, shall we say, technological civilization living in orbit around Tabby Star, they don't know that we have any kind of radio capability here on Earth yet. They will not know that for a long time. And certainly 1,485 years ago, when we were... Well, the, any signals we're receiving from Tabby Star were sent. They had that wasn't the case at all. So, what we'll hear from Dr. Schaefer next is an explanation of his work and what it might imply and why it leaves us completely in the dark about what's going on with Tabby Star. Bradley E. Schaefer is professor of physics and astronomy at the Louisiana State University. He received his PhD in 1983 from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has published widely in astronomy and astrophysics, including work in supernovas, gamma ray bursts, Kuiper belt objects, the light curves of solar system objects, and even Sherlock Holmes and astronomy. Dr. Schaefer's latest publication is a preprint entitled KIC 8462852 Faded at an Average Rate of 0.165 Plus or Minus 0.013 Magnitudes Per Century from 1890 to 1989. <laughs> As you know, there's probably know there's been quite a stir today when a preprint of yours came out. And mm -hmm. uh, now a lot of people, including myself, have been following the story of Tabby's star pretty closely. And sure, because uh, 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 for, from an astronomer's point of view, I am looking at it closely because she's found a wacko weird object that we don't have any explanation for. It's unique. 
and we don't understand what's going on, and that makes it important for us. And and I, I understand how people, um, uh, uh, not astronomers, are looking at this as being a long shot for some well, extreme speculative ideas. And and uh, sure, I, I understand the interest. I, just the fact that it's got everybody baffled makes it interesting. I think. Yeah. Uh, now today, the preprint that you that I think it appeared today, or perhaps yesterday, yes, that you put out is a new contribution to the study of that star. Indeed. Now, you, what you did, if, and tell me if I got this wrong, is you went back and looked at historical data quite deeply uh, right. about the, the magnitude of that particular star over the last, uh, say, 125 years or so? Well, from 1890 to present. Um, so, yeah, it's something in that ballpark, yeah. I would call it the plate stacks. Uh, perhaps more better name for it would be um, the collection of archival sky photographs at the Harvard College Observatory. I see. Now, were these all taken with the same telescope, or? No, no, no. They're they're, they're taken with a wide variety of telescopes. I think I ended up actually uh, using probably data from six different telescopes uh, uh, scattered widely around the world, too, actually. And, and the photographic technology changed a bit over that time. Uh, indeed it did. Um, and so there were different uh, for, uh, probably you wouldn't be going into this to your readers, but for uh, a technical uh, uh, audience or for astronomers who actually know what's going on, um, a, a relevant and significant question would be, well, how do I know that the fading that I see isn't simply due to, oh, the emulsions being different in early times than in later times or something like that. And the, the quick and sure answer is you can look at the light curves of the check stars that I have next to it. And the check stars are of the same brightness, um, very close in the sky, and critically for a technical astronomer is they have the same color. And the check stars don't fade like that. Um, and that is a, an adequate proof that no, these emulsion, they've done millions of stars, and so they know perfectly well that what, what astronomers would call the color term or the color equation is negligibly small. We, we've known that up for, for, for a long time. Um, so uh, nevertheless, for this star in particular, uh, we do have that proof. But that's getting into the sort of technical detail that astronomers um, would worry about, and, well, that right. might not be what you'd want to tell to, to, to the public, although, well, although you could if you want to. Well, my listeners are mostly geeks. They love that kind of technical detail. Ah, so, okay, sure. You looked at plates that were using a blue filter, or is it a... No, it's, it's actually we're not taken with any filter at all. So the what we would call spectral sensitivity um, is entirely in the emulsion itself. I see. That is... Um, uh, the emulsion is sensitive to light only out to, to, to some wavelength of light, which is um, getting between the blue and the green. So, so yellow light it, it wouldn't be recorded on the emulsion at all. And, and so there, there, there's a range in there which we could describe as being blue, um, which the plate is sensitive to. Well, actually, the plate is sensitive to even bluer light. It's sensitive to ultraviolet light. But none of that gets through the atmosphere and or the lenses, because the lenses are made up of quartz and um, uh, excuse me, uh, made up of glass, um, and that does not transmit ultraviolet. So you have a cutoff towards the long wavelength where the emulsion just isn't sensitive, and you have a cutoff towards the short wavelength where the light doesn't get to the photographic um, emulsion. And so there's a relatively narrow band in there, which we would call colloquially blue. I see. And, and so that, that's all we're getting from this. This uh, very long, well, it seems like a very long span of astronomical data that you took from this collection. Uh, you mentioned the check stars. So you, you verified that, that other stars nearby were not varying in brightness in, a, in an unusual way. So, Correct. Uh, using these check stars. And you, you had something like, what, what is it? Something like 1,300? Uh, measurements over that period of time? A slight bit less, but yes. And Well, I, I'll put a link in I, the... I, I, think, I think the number was 1,232, if I remember that, right. That sounds it, right, it, yeah. It's something around in there. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have a small screen here, so I can't bring up the paper at the same time. But, uh, <laughs> oh, that's the, fine. I did read it. So you had this over th more than 1,000 data points spanning, mm -hmm. spanning roughly a century 
with a gap in the 50s and 60s when they weren't taking, collecting these plates, I guess? Uh, uh, effectively, yeah. Uh, it, there, there wasn't a complete stoppage, but uh, the then director at the time, Donald Menzel, um, stopped the program because he wanted the, um, the cost of this um, to be spent on his own solar eclipse studies. And <laughs> there are other things involved which I should not tell a reporter for publication in a, a national press place. Yes, I, I did look up the mental gap. Uh, it's kind of interesting story, but it's just kind of an aside to this. What what I understand is that after carefully checking uh, these stars and and doing some smoothing on it, you you found uh, that over, that somewhere around you start the data starts around 1890. Is that correct? Correct. My yeah. my earliest plate was I think uh, well in 1890, and I don't remember when in that year, but yeah, 1890. Sometime, somewhere around 1900 to 1910, there seems to be a dip in brightness. Right, and I would uh, I, that that dip in brightness that you see in the light curve. Um, you see, one of the, the the points there has a pretty large error bar, so you you, you couldn't make too much of that. The other one, um, uh, I, I I don't hold um, that that dip is to be of high confidence. Um, so you can characterize it as, as randomness. Um, it's based on a relatively few number of points. Um, and, uh, that, that dip there is, 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 is not of high confidence. Let, let's put it that way. I see. Okay. Whereas, whereas the slope and the existence that is not flat, that is a very high confidence for all the reasons said, but, but, but details of it, well, you, you can see what the error bars are. They, they, they go up and they go down and there you go. And, um, so um, uh, when, when uh, Tabby was originally looking at the original thing, because she, she got the, 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 the dash light curve also, and if you don't do the binning, um, well, the individual points are kind of scattered all around, and you lose this relatively small decline. And so you, you have to uh, have experience enough to actually have see, um, uh, uh, to look at that light curve and say, wait a minute, that thing's declining, and then realize, oh, gee, you can make it obvious if you go binning up in time. I see. You look. You did. You had access to the dash survey, which I, I believe is a, a digitized version of these plates, or, or is it just indeed? A, and then you had. You also went back in manually and looked at quite a few of them yourself. Indeed, uh, uh, because that's kind of one of the things I do. Um, uh, uh, partly because the the Harvard plates have not been fully digitized, so um, many of my target stars are down in the Milky Way, which hasn't been digitized yet. And so um, um, I, I can't do it off of Dash, so I have to do it by eye. Um, so w what I used uh, the, for, for the purpose of this paper, um, uh, th th there's some advantage to doing it both with the Dash photometry um, and my by eye photometry. The reason is Dash is actually a wonderful program, beautifully done awesome amount of work. It's just, and, 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 and the technical skill, there are a lot of things I know that they do that are technically very good. Um, I, I'm not involved with them at all, although clearly I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to them, uh, but, but they do a wonderful job. And um, however, one can come back and say that this, um, when you do it by this scanning method where you digitize the plates and then uh, do some relatively complex analysis, you can say that this, the dash method, the scanning method, is um, uh, quite slow and it's very expensive and the whole analysis is rather complex. On the other hand, the by eye method, the traditional method, the one that often enough is even more accurate than the um, the scanning method. The by eye method is fast, cheap, and simple. You just waltz in and you do it, and you got a confident answer, probably a little bit better than what you can do from scanning. Hmm. So I've done them both. What the heck? Um, and so I've done it both ways, and both ways show a very highly significant uh, slope at about the same level. And they, they agree to within all required accuracy. So um, what I have done is I've confirmed the existence of this fading, both with my by eye method and a completely independent with the dash photometry. And so what this buys us, and again, this is a technical point that, that astronomers will, will, will realize and, and, and be thankful for, is, you know, dash is actually a remarkably good program. 
and they, but they, it's rather complex. And you know, if, an, if you're an outsider, you, you'd wonder, oh, gee, did, did they get, you know, wh- what little artifact could be a, a product of the dash scanning or analysis or or or, or their computations or uh, you don't know what. And so here I've gone through and done it by eye, and it's completely independent of Dash, completely independent. And all of a sudden, they get the same results, and that shows you that the, um, that the result, that this general fading, is robust. That is, it's not due to some random error in Dash. No, because my by eye method is not going to make the same error. Um, so by doing it both by eye and by Dash, um, I can get good confidence that it's not just simply some who knows what's at error in the scanning or the analysis of Dash. Right. And, and you found with some error bars that there's a, a pretty steady decline in the brightness of the star over that period of time. Right. Yes. And, and, and I, 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 I have modeled it uh, and fitted it to straight lines, but um, but I don't have the accuracy to be able to prove that you know, it's a linear decline or or even that it's a monotonic decline. So so yeah, I, I can fit a line to it, but um, right. and it looks roughly like it's it's uh, fading roughly uniformly in time. You know, other than this 1900 to 1909 uh, uh, dip. Um, but uh, exactly how it declines, um, my data is not of good enough accuracy to determine whether it's really linear or whether it uh, bounces up and down as it falls or, or what have you. Right, and that's in your preprint, so if people want to see it for themselves, they can go look at it. Okay. That's right. Yeah, uh, and it is, it, you know, just eyeballing it, it does look like it's going down significantly, um, but... And, and, and the, the general idea that it starts off in the 1890s as being substantially brighter and that over time it dims, that one, um, that one I have very high confidence in. The exact details of exactly how it declines, well, you know, the error bars aren't, aren't the smallest, and, and uh, we, we, we can argue about the 1900 to 1909 dip, but, but, but the basic result, which is all that matters for the purposes at hand, the basic result that hey, the tabby star is fading by about 20% over the last century. Ooh. Uh, so, so that part I do feel very confident in. Now, is that precedented? Do we know of any other no. main sequence stars that have ever done that? No, none, zero. There's no theoretical understanding of how an F3 main sequence star can have any such fading on a time scale of a century, much less on the time scale of a million years, much less anywhere else on the main sequence. There's zero precedent. Now, is, is that because we haven't well, looked or because... Been, I, oh, we've looked, we've looked. Yeah. Uh, for, for example, you have, you have ordinary stars, uh, you know, the bright stars, the many thousands of stars you can see in the naked eye. Um, those have been monitored for centuries, and, and you have stars down to um, uh, much fainter magnitudes that people have been looking at, um, uh, maybe not in this detail, but they aren't fading. Stars don't fade. And we also have, for example, we have the dash photometry of a huge millions of stars in the sky. And so, after all, Dash has been making these light curves for many millions of stars, and, and no, they don't see anything like this over a very large number. Nothing like this has ever been seen, and, and I have a, a, an incredibly wide knowledge of these sorts of things. Nothing like this has ever been seen. Now, you've got to be a little careful. There are some stars that, that fade and get brighter, but, so maybe I should say nothing like this, uh, uh, nothing like a, a significant fading on the time scale of one century has ever been seen for a main sequence star. Okay. That, that's probably a safe statement. Now, you, you looked at one of the proffered hypotheses for the very short period dips in Tabby Star, which were roughly the same, mm-hmm. roughly the same amount, uh, you know, right. within, you know, for within round numbers. Uh, yeah. And you... You posit that if it's the same mechanism, then uh, say a swarm of comets, then you need a whole lot more comets, right? Is that? Have I got that right? Yeah, um, maybe I could, could could paraphrase the logic here and, and, and hopefully make it a little bit uh, uh, step by step, just to, uh, to 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 make sure so we can test every every link in this chain. 
Okay. Um, um, the, the, the first link is to realize the, how, how these two effects are manifesting themselves. They're basically manifesting themselves identically. Here you have two phenomena, the Kepler dips, which are on time scales of one day and 100 days, and you have the Harvard fading, which is manifesting itself on the time scale of 10 years and 100 years. Okay, um, both of those phenomena are manifest, uh, manifesting themselves only as 20% photometric dips. Okay, no other way. The, uh, neither of these things is, is seen in any other way. And, and, and so they're basically identical things, and both of them, the dips and the fading, are wacko, unique, never before seen on any other star, or, or certainly any other star like it. Um, and so we have two phenomena which are identical, except on time scale, that are identical and completely unique, both appearing on one star. Okay, that's, a, that's a little bit of the setup. The next part is an Occam's razor argument. Um, you could easily come up with an explanation that has one physical mechanism for the, um, for the Kepler dips and another physical, a completely separate independent physical mechanism for the Harvard fading. Okay, that's a possible hypothesis. This is, you know, it's maybe the first thing you'd think of. The, the, uh, another thing you'd think of is that they're both manifestations of the same phenomena. So you have two hypotheses, one where you have one mechanism that produces 20% dips in light and no other manifestation. The other hypothesis is you have two independent mechanisms that are both manifest only as 20% dips and are a unique phenomena. Now, you have either one such phenomena or another such identical phenomena, and so Occam's razor is, is preference for the simpler explanation, and which is simpler? One phenomena X or two phenomena Xs, where, um, where the two phenomena are completely different. Well, okay, yeah, it do doesn't take much thinking to realize that yeah, it's an awful lot easier to come up with one phenomena that has a little bit of variation in time scale, and, and I'm sampling the long time scale version, and Tabby's sampling the short time scale version. That's perfectly fine. Um, now, Occam's razor arguments are not proof, right? But they're they're, they're getting up there, you know. Um, so there really could be two identical, completely different phenomena uh, mechanisms, uh, but. You know, and I know that that's not really there. So the next uh, the next step in the chain is the realization that both the Kepler dips and the Harvard fading are just merely aspects of the same phenomena. Mm -hmm. So whatever mechanism is causing the Kepler dips, it's the same mechanism um, uh, with a different time scale. It's the same mechanism that's causing the Harvard dip, uh, the Harvard fading. Right. So there's lo there's very low frequency and high frequency terms to this. Yeah. Yeah. Phenomenon. Exactly. That's a good way of that's a fine way of putting it. Sure. Okay. Um, so once you have the fairly strong realization, although not proof with a capital P, once you have the strong realization that they're they're just aspects all of the same one mechanism, then you can start asking about how. The, the comet family mechanism, say, can explain the Harvard fading. Well, okay, or, or any of these dust occultation ideas, because dust occultation ideas, they're, they're reasonable. They're, 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 that's kind of what everyone would, would first think of uh, default to. Um, once you have that, though, uh, so you can concoct a comet family model that explains you know, the, the, one, the one day 20% dip as seen in Kepler. Mm -hmm. Turns out what you actually have to do, no one likes it, nobody. Um, you can come up with that model, and at least you can't refute it for the one day stuff. It's pretty contrived. Um, uh, there's a paper by Bodman and Quinn, uh, Quillen where they come out and say, to, dis to, to, to model this one day, just, just one of the day dips in the Kepler light curve, you need 36 
humongous, supergiant comets. Comets larger than ever before seen by humanity, and they all happen to be passing right in front of the star at the same time, and there are 36 of them. Now, that's not impossible, <laughs> but pretty contrived. Mm -hmm. You have to do a lot of fine-tuning and, and, and wave a magic wand every now and then. But it's at least not impossible. Right. So, um, so uh, unfortunately, most of the other, in fact, all of the other ideas that one can come up with to explain this, um, you can kind of refute fairly easily. Largely, there's no infrared excess, and all of the other ideas require an infrared excess. Whoops. Hmm, how do you do that? Okay, so the other ideas are all refuted, <laughs> okay, except the comet family model idea is not refuted. And so that's why Tabby went off and, and did the usual sorts of things of um, putting it forth. As, it's the best of a bad lot of, of proposals. No one likes the idea, but if it's the best of a bad lot, well, it's your best idea, Okay. Um, so what I can do, and this is kind of the next further step in the chain here, is realize that even the comet model can't really work either. Um, and, and so the, the uh, so the next step in the chain is you put together the last two links, and for example, um, if one of those dips takes 36 percent, uh, 36 supergiant comets, and the Harvard fading is of the same mechanism, well, you'd have to have other supergiant comets causing the general fading at Harvard. Now, Harvard fading from 1890 to, to about now is about 20%. The one-day Kepler dip is 20%. So you have to dim the star first 20% to get down to the current Kepler baseline level, but you've got to get down another 20 more percent for that one-day dip. So that one-day dip not only needs 36 supergiant comets to explain the one-day dip, but it also needs um, another 36 comets simply to get it down to the level of the Kepler baseline level where it's faded to. So that one day, you need twice 36 supergiant comets. It's all happening to pass in front of the same thing. Hmm. Okay, so, okay, well, you're up to, to 72 supergiant comets instead of 36. Well, that's not that big a deal. Or if you, you know, if you've, if you've waved your magic wand to get 36 comets, you can wave it perfectly well to get at 72. Huh. Okay. But, you know, in the 1,500 days of Kepler, the Kepler observations, well, the, 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 the duration of any one comet passing in front of the star, well, we know that from the Kepler dip. It's about one day. So the Kepler, whole Kepler light curve, it's about 1,500 days long. And so to, to dim the star from its, uh, you know, its 1890 level down to the, to, to the Kepler baseline, well, for one day worth, you have to have 36 com uh, great comets to get you in, in there. Fine. Um, you have to, the next day, all those comets which dimmed you the previous day, the, the, the next day, those comets are gone. They're, they're, they're passed away. They've passed to the other side of the star, and you, you don't see the dust from them. And so there has to be another 36 new com giant, supergiant comets coming in to pass over. And every day you have to have these 36 more supergiant comets passing repeatedly in front and in front and in front. And so for the whole 1,500 days of the Kepler light curve, you need 1,500 times 36 supergiant comets passing in front and then you need an extra um, 36 just to create that one Kepler dip down below the baseline level. So you're, you're needing an awful lot of comets to cover this, you know, 150, uh, 1500 day Kepler light curve. And when you, you look at, you, well, you need this not only just for the 1500 days of the Kepler, you need it for the last century. <laughs> and so it turns out you're going to need something like, you know, a, a million or a fraction of a million of these supergiant comets. Hmm. And that's an awful lot of comets. It's more than would have around our whole solar system. And these supergiant comets are a lot larger than anything ever seen in our solar system. You know, Comet Hale-Bopp was 
with 60 kilometers diameter, and, and these comets have to be 200 kilometer diameters. Holy cow, that's just too big. Right. Well, you, you can always come back and say, well, we don't know what other stars' systems would be like, and so uh, you can wave a magic wand and, and suddenly get enough comets that happen to be large enough. Okay, I suppose you could do that. No one would believe you, but you could, do, you could, you could make that claim. But then, even if you do have the, the solar system, you know, the, the, the faraway star having its outer solar system having this many giant comets, you then have the horrific trouble, how do you get the hundred comets to all pass in front of the star in a nice good little timed interval over the first century, over the last century? I don't think there is any possible physical mechanism that can have that many, um, that many supergiant comets passing in front of a star all within one century. It's just not there. And so what this means is that well, if you have the, 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 the Kepler dip from these supergiant comets, just 36 of them per dip, well, you also have to have um, uh, the, the Harvard dimming coming from comets. After all, we, we know it's the same mechanism by the Occam's razor argument. And so to get the full Harvard fading plus the Kepler dips, you need a huge number of comets. And there's just no physical way that you can get them to pass in front of the same star all within a century. Uh, so, and, and, and so, so the model becomes implausible, and, and even, even the proponents kind of say, oh, shoot, okay, well, we'll think of something else. <laughs> so we have, we are, we're back to square one then on explanations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At, so at, this point, at this point, there are zero published explanations that aren't refuted. Okay. So and that uh, includes, and, uh, and by the way, that includes. We'll, we'll just call it the extreme speculative ideas. That's also refuted to a couple of different ways. I have a question from uh, Marshall Eubanks on Facebook. He said, he asked, did you, did you try to do a spectral analysis to look for periodicities uh, less than 100 years? Um, uh, yes, and the answer is basically no. Um, I, I found no periodicity on, on, on that time. No. Okay. Uh, it, 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 it basically wouldn't hold up very well anyway. So, uh, but, but uh, no, there is no apparent periodicity. Uh, and you've, I think you've already answered his other question about uh, looking at a large sample of F3 main sequence stars to see how often, how often they, those fades occur. You, the answer is that has been looked at, and they don't. Yes. Uh, so so uh, uh, I have not, although I've actually looked at a lot of these stars like that, um, but um, the, the official answer would be the DASH photometry people have already looked at, and I'm not sure the exact numbers, but, but for F-type main sequence stars, they've probably already looked through 100,000, and if you, looked, um, if, if you talk about main sequence stars, they're probably in the many, many, many millions of stars, and main sequence stars do not do this. Um, that we know very confident. Um, we know it for an awful lot of stars. And we have pretty good models of, uh, so that, you know, we wouldn't, there's no risk, nothing in the models that said that should happen, right? So. Exactly. So that's another perfectly adequate argument. We really understand what main sequence stars are doing. We, we really understand them very well. And there is no loophole by which an F3 main sequence star can, well, intrinsically, um, can, can vary like this. They, they, they just don't. They can't. They, uh, 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 and that's a very strong theoretical statement um, that I actually haven't heard anyone doubting. You've looked at, you essentially looked at the Harvard Plate Collection. Are there any other sources of data we could use to firm up this, this uh, result? Well, um, um, uh, uh, Tabby already has looked at a, a, a number of good, good places, and all those data never really go back very far. Um, my first try was looking at the ASAS, A-S-A-S database, and they do not have the, 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 the KIC star. Um, okay, fair enough. Um, so um, basically the answer is um, no. Um, there is not any other usable data source. Oh, sure, you can go back and look at the, Harvard, uh, at, at the Palomar plates and get a, get a magnitude in the 1950s. The trouble is... Um, for a, uh, these old various, you know, lo looking at old deep Schmidt plates like the Palomar plates, you can do that, but the magnitudes are never exact enough. You could not be able to see 
a, um, a, a, a 0.2 magnitude per uh, 0.2 magnitude per century um, decline. They aren't. They just aren't that accurate. Also, they're all, uh, they're all uh, each one of them is going to have a separate. Well, we would call it a photometric system. They have slightly different spectral sensitivities and different calibration scales, and 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 this results in 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 in, in uh, these calibration troubles result in in jumps up and down from source to source to source of of a tenth of a magnitude or something like that, and um, you're you're left with. Um, uh, you, you, you can't really use, for example, the old Palomar plates versus some modern source because they're on different scales. They aren't accurate enough anyway. So largely the answer is, yeah, me and various other people have looked and we can think of um, uh, nothing other than the Harvard plates, and I'll qualify that in a moment here. Um, we can think of nothing other than the Harvard plates that gets you, that, that can go checking or testing this sort of thing um, um, uh, from before the launch of Kepler in 2009. Now, so the, basically the Harvard plates are it. The Harvard plates have the, the, the majority of the world's plates in toto. Um, there is one loophole to, to a claim that the Harvard plates are the only thing that you can get this sort of a, a long-term light curve on for before 2009. The loophole is one that most people wouldn't think of. It turns out that there's an observatory in Germany called Sonneborg. Sonneborg Observatory in Sonneborg, Germany, um, which does have plates going back to the 1930s. And they actually continue up um, even past when the Harvard stopped. That was actually part of my doing, too. <laughs> I managed to get them to per avoid closing the observatory. Or it was one of the helpful voices of an outsider, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, fine. Anyway, uh, Sonneberg has plates from the 1930s to the 1990s. And um, in principle and in practice, you could go back and get a similar light curve from Sonneberg. How are we going to go about resolving this, uh, this conundrum? Is there, is, what, what's the next thing to do? Well, um, let me give you a couple ideas here. Um, one possibility is if I had to guess, I would think that what's really going on is that this is, there's an accretion disk or, or, or there's a disk in the system, maybe a debris disk. And it's eccentric in orbit. We know that for a variety of reasons. It's eccentric in orbit. It's geometrically thin. Maybe you can somehow concoct a ring or a disk, you know, with the uh, size of the Jupiter's orbit or something like that, maybe you could somehow concoct a disk and make blobs in it and put it in just the right orbit. And maybe you could do that. And, and, and if you make the properties just right, maybe you can have it squeeze under the infrared limits. Hmm. So that's kind of, if I had to guess, I'd guess it's something like that. Now, to be honest, you know, it sounds pretty cruddy because I don't think it matches the data at all. Because I don't think you really can do it um, and, and avoid the infrared limit with, with a debris disk that big. Now, you know, but somebody out there should try modeling it. See what range of parameter space you can get away with. Maybe, maybe there's, maybe, maybe there's some, some model out there involving a disk. Um, I, I don't know what that would be. Um, this is a hope, and actually a hope that I'm pretty sure is going to get dashed. <laughs> uh -huh. um, um, but what you, um, you know, that, that's the best try. May, maybe, maybe some theorists can work out a way that you can satisfy all the constraints. May, maybe, maybe, maybe. It's not very hopeful. Okay. Now, uh, things like that, you, you might still be able to pull something out. I, I don't know. Um, I don't think it likely, but this is, nothing else is any better. You see, the trouble we got here is we've just ruled out every last published model. Right. And, but, but it still dips. It's kind of like Galileo, but it moves, but it dips. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, if you have, the dips are happening. Right. But we've ruled out all models, but something's making it dip, dang it. And what is it? So we have a basic paradox here. We've ruled out all models, but the thing still dips. So uh, in general, 
the, the answer has to be something like as follows. It's one of two things. The answer has to be either that there's some hidden loophole in one of the refutations and nature has moved into that loophole, hidden loophole. Mm-hmm. And so maybe we, I, who knows who is doing something just a little wrong or not looking right or making an argument that you can find a loophole. Somehow, maybe one of our, um, one of our refutations has a loophole. That's possibility number one. Possibility number two is, well, it's some idea no one's thought of yet, or at least no one's published yet. Maybe, <laughs> you know, for all I know. Um, so this would be the, and then a miracle occurs, solution of some theorist coming up with a, uh, yet another model that actually fits all the constraints. And uh, we haven't seen that come around yet, but maybe it's out there um, or, or will be out there. I, I don't know. The thing is, Mother Nature is doing what it wants to do independent, and, and it's doing it. And just because we haven't thought of a good model doesn't mean Mother Nature is not doing it. Right. Uh, is there, are there any other observations or classes of observations that could help? Um, yes, there is. Um, um, I, I should uh, pro forma come back and mention um, uh, that in principle, one should have my results at Harvard gone back and tested with the Sonnenberg plates. Um, I'm very confident in mine. Um, they're, they're pretty straightforward. It's, it's actually a very simple sort of thing. Um, so I, I, I don't doubt that the Sonnenberg would, well, presumably, hopefully, confirm my, my basic Harvard result. Fine. But here's a set of observations that Tabby and the American Association of Variable Star Observers are working on desperately to try and get working. Um, Kepler, the spacecraft, is now no longer looking at this KIC star. Fine. Um, but we, it wouldn't have been too much use anyway because, because what would happen is every three months, Kepler would send down the light curve. And so you wouldn't know when the Kepler star is dimming. And the dimming happens for one day, and by the time you get the data back to the ground and examine it, the, the, dim, the, the dip is months gone. <laughs> right. So what, what Tabby is doing, and the American Association of Variable Star Observers is doing, and, and they're the world's best amateur, um, the world's best amateur. Most of them are, or many of them are pro-quality, some even better than pro-quality, but that's another issue. Mm. Um, they're an incredibly good group of people who dedicated large amounts of time and large amounts of thought and ingenuity to measuring variable stars. And so one of the things that the AVSO has done, um, with Tabby being the, the director, the, the, the asker, is um, those people are monitoring Tabby's star um, probably near full time. And so uh, I actually have not heard whether they have found dips. But the idea is as follows. Um, the AAVSO people sit on the star, and at some point that star is going to start fading in a, yet another dip. When it does, they, um, the people who, you know, around the world, probably multiple people will spot it, they immediately call up AAVSO headquarters and saying, ah, Tabby Star, going into dip, go! And the AAVSO people will immediately call up Tabby, they'll have things worked out in advance, I've done this sort of thing before, and um, Tabby will have a telescope on tap, um, which when someone says go, they will immediately hop over to the Tabby star and start taking detailed observations. So this is a dodge device by which we can, um, if we were a little bit patient and things work out well, we can actually get modern telescope observations of Tabby's star in the middle of a dip. Okay. If you can get especially a spectroscopy of Tabby's star in the middle of the dip, then you can start determining the nature of the occulter. If you can start finding one of these faint, uh, if, you, if you can find in the middle of the dip, if you find that it's achromatic, then you'd be dealing with relatively large occulters. Or if there's a gaseous component, you might see, for example, the calcium or sodium lines or hydrogen line uh, causing absorption that gets dipped up the, the, uh, in, in the absorption spectrum. Or if it's small dust, you would see a particular type of reddening. So if we can catch with modern telescopes, if we can catch 
tabby star in the middle of a dip, then we should be able to determine the nature of the dipper, at least to, to some uh, to, to within the, the usual ballparks. And that should then suddenly make the whole thing pretty clear, I think. So that's the plan, is we have the world's amateur astronomers monitoring the star. When the next time it goes into a dip, they yell loudly, and professional astronomers whip their telescopes around and start taking spectra and colors, and that should be able to tell us the nature of the occulting. Oh, sounds pretty exciting. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. This has caused a, quite a stir. People are interested in your <laughs> interested in your result. All right. Well, uh, well, thanks very much. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Hey. Bye. Bye. I'd like to thank Brad Schaefer for spending time with us and on such short notice. And it was a very enlightening interview. He put everything in plain English for us when he was called upon to do so. So I, right now, I don't really have any more to add about Tabby Star. I think we do need to cover it in more depth. I'm going to sit down and write a blog post and then I'll probably put out a burst on it. Uh, but right now, let's just... Uh, digest what we've heard tonight there's something very weird about this star and nobody has a good idea what it is uh, the only thing weird about it are the dips and brightness which uh, by themselves don't make sense you should see other things so hopefully the AAVSO uh, which I understand is a fine organization of variable star observers will help us catch it in the act and we'll learn a lot more before too many more moons pass us by I'd like to thank also our patrons for the wow signal and since I'm not exactly sure which patrons I've thanked and which haven't I'm just going to thank them all right now the we'll start with Jan McAvoy, I hope I pronounced that right, Ian or Ion McAvoy, uh, a very generous patron, Alex Green, Peter Brandt, Chris Watkins, our very first patron, Stephen Fernandez, Andrew McDonnell in Adelaide, Australia. Andrew, your T-shirt is on its way. To Australia. Some guy named Mike Mongo. Tara Mulder. And Duff Deal. Thanks, folks. Your generous support really is helping to defray our costs quite a lot. And the more episodes we get out, the more our costs will be covered. We understand that, and we're going to be doing that my understanding is that there is an astrobiology related episode on its way out to you. Uh, it may be a, a little bit longer. There have been a lot of physical, logistical issues, but we're going to get it out to you. And we're going to keep covering things like Tabby Star and the Breakthrough Initiatives and other it, things that are of interest to our listeners and to us. We'd love to hear from you, yes, you, about what you thought of this particular episode and this topic. So the way to give us feedback is to come to wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com and you can leave a post on the blog post for this episode. You can also go to our Google Plus community for listeners and leave a post there or make a comment. Or you can go to our Wow Signal listeners subreddit and post there. You can either leave a comment on the post for this episode or just start your own post. We welcome all discussion, 
all comments, all criticism. And we are happy to hear from you. If you want to contribute to this podcast, as our Patreon contributors have, just go to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash wow signal. And you can sign up there to donate a small amount of money for each episode we put out. And you can also cap the amount if you're concerned uh, quite irrationally, by the way, that we might put out a lot of episodes in one month. We won't do that. But you, you can uh, also participate or support our spinoff podcast, The Unseen Podcast. Now, if you want to participate in The Unseen Podcast and you don't know how to get started, just write to unseenpodcast at gmail.com. We typically record Friday evenings on the East Coast of the United States. If you want to participate in any of those panel discussions, just sign up. We'll let you know how you can get involved. You don't have to be an expert on podcasting or audio engineering. You just have to have some very simple equipment and the willingness to sit down and talk seriously about an interesting topic. That's all you need. So that again, go to unseenpodcast.com and to learn more. To learn more about this episode or everything else we cover at the Wow Signal, go to wowsignalpodcast.com. To contact me or any other member of the Wow Signal team, you can write to wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com. And now, here's a little music to take us out from Season 3, Episode 3 of the Wow Signal. This is George Krab with... Svitislav Lobster. chance he's asked to play it with a wink and a collect call like a sage with an answer refusing to say it it's assumed he can do it all while every train that arrives at the station is booked without a fee though he appreciates the destination His fare is always paid by me By me White and black keys Are played with ease The memories Which used to tease No longer affect him late in his life when he realized the notion he still had plenty notes left to play not a friend or a wife but something from the ocean could give him the will to stay all the intense scrutiny and crazy pressure resulted in a desperate plea so by summoning the will of this red companion He could do it all because of me Because of me This has been The Wow Signal A podcast produced by the Dream of Open Channel Please visit wowsignalpodcast.com for more information All music presented on this podcast is either Creative Commons or is presented with the permission of the artist the Wow Signal is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike License.
offering up no resistance, making sure one and one or two. Though the calm on his face is due to my assistance, I do not want the credit due. As the notes and the chords light up the arena, it's not the stand light that helps him see. On the stage is pure fabrication As he travels back and forth Across the nation Acting like stud Despite castration All thanks to this plastic crustacean He achieves it all Because of me Because of me From the seas to hell, the peace, his strange disease. No thanks, no please. I decide to protect him. Ha, ha, ha.